Welcome, Dr. Robert Cleary. Dr. Cleary is a colorectal surgeon in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He is also the president of the Association of Program Directors in Colorectal Surgery in his first year in that term. Uh, welcome this morning, Bob. Thank you, Stephen. I'm really pleased to see you sitting and looking uh, at us in the camera because I'd heard from our mutual friend, Jerry Eisenberg, of, of your ordeal, which is why I reached out to you wish you health and then subsequently an interview. So our interview with, with Bob this morning is, is going to be a somewhat different format than all the rest of them. Um, uh, Bob's going to tell us his story about how he contracted COVID-19, uh, his battle with it, and his thankful uh, recovery. Thanks, Steve. And I apologize up front that I may cough a little bit. I'm still having some pulmonary issues in the recovery process. On March 25th, I did a colectomy uh, because it was for cancer. We were doing cancer cases at that time and after the case didn't feel well, had a temp to 100.4 and then went and had my temperature taken or went to the emergency department to get tested for COVID. They turned it around a short period of time and was positive. I probably didn't get it from the hospital. Uh, my daughter would travel to Savannah to visit my other daughter and there were people coughing in the airport and so she likely brought that home. <clears throat> um, and she had a cough for three weeks that no one paid too much attention to. She didn't have fever or other symptoms. So being positive, I was at home anyway because of the hospital regulations um, and only came in to do the case for cancer. And over the course of the next seven days, my symptoms started to progress aches and chills, a mild shortness of breath. And I was being followed by the St. Joe's team with a mobile app. And after seven days, they thought that I probably should be admitted. <coughs> so I sat down at home with my laptop and I wrote a letter to my family because I knew that I might not see them again. And I told them how much I love them I have children, six children, between the ages of 21 and 32. I told them how much I loved them and how proud I was of them. And I knew that if I didn't make it, eventually they'd find that letter on my laptop desktop. My wife drove me to the hospital. Um, she can't come in. So I kissed her knowing that this may be her last hug and kiss. Went into the emergency department. The ER doc showed me the x-ray and it was frightening, bilateral, fluffy infiltrates in all lobes. So I was admitted to the ICU. I had outstanding care by the ICU. I was there for 11 days. <clears throat> it's a frightening place. I heard a doc who was a patient, I think in the Bronx, say that nighttime is the worst time. And it is. It's quiet. They can't come in without a lot of PPE, and it's difficult to take care of COVID patients because you have to limit exposures, but they came in as much as humanly possible. There was a young nurse who at night would call in every couple of hours to reassure me and keep me grounded in reality. COVID plays with your mind too. I had some hallucinations, but other things that I, it's hard to describe, just experiences that aren't based in reality and that you don't realize aren't based in reality for several minutes after you wake up. Anyway, my pulmonary condition continued to deteriorate and I developed a DVT. They placed me on prophylactic Lovenox when I was admitted, and then changed that to therapeutic after the DVT, but DVT made both my feet and ankles really painful. It was impossible to walk even to the bathroom. And so I was in bed for 11 days. And around the sixth or seventh day, though things were continuing to deteriorate, the next conversation with the critical care team was intubation. <clears throat> I had such bad tachypnea, I almost wanted to be intubated. Um, but then my condition stopped deteriorating and they didn't need to intubate me. And over the next few days, my oxygen requirements got a little bit better, 
and I was able, my wife is a nurse and uh, was very comfortable taking care of me at home. And I was discharged on four to six liters of O2 by nasal cannula. So I've been home for three weeks now and it's not day by day improvement, it's week by week. That's a little frustrating. So it's been three weeks, but I've only been off oxygen now for two days. That was, that's a little frightening because you think if you don't get off oxygen, you're never going back to work. The DVTs have completely resolved. My appetite has returned and that's good because I lost 25 pounds. And fortunately, none of the other organ systems um, were involved. You know, as you know, there are some people who get renal failure requiring dialysis. And I was fortunate not to have that. Some of the FaceTime conversations with my family reinforced a lot of my faith. I prepared for death in the ICU, thought about it a lot. And it, though it's frightening, I'm surprised I wasn't more frightened because I've had a great life. I was ready. I have a terrific wife. I have six terrific children. There's nothing left unsaid, nothing left undone. And I knew if I didn't make it, they would be in good hands. And I had all sorts of communication from family and friends and colleagues. People were saying rosaries for me. I couldn't help but think, and even now, every day, first thing I do when I wake up is giving thanks that God spared me, giving thanks that I'm alive. But I also think about all those people in the ICU who don't have families. Think about the patients we see in the day when you ask them who's their family. They don't have family. We say, well, we'll be your family while you're here. So I think about people who suffer or die from this disease alone. The CRNAs at our institution, if I did need to get intubated, I would know the person intubating me. And not just our hospital, but the stories about their experiences eye to eye with a patient that they know they may be the last human they see are both heartbreaking and heartwarming. And so here I am with a long road to recovery. Well, I was hoping that maybe I could go back to work June 1st. We'll see the limiting factor is the tachypnea and that has to, and the weight gain that has to get better. Sorry, that's probably more than you wanted to hear. Oh, that's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you, your story is, is heart-wrenching uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you've uh, recovered it as you have. Uh, as you say, thank God uh, indeed and, and, and please God, you continue your recovery and you get back to your full state of health and full state of work, lead your family, lead your residency program, nationally lead us with our uh, program directors association. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that uh, you've come as, as far as you have. Um, I, I'm not going to prolong uh, the interview given your here to get me and, and, and coughing. Uh, the story you've, you've shared is incredibly moving. Uh, I, I would uh, only ask if you have any advice for anyone else uh, going forward. Talk to those who have been through it. And again, I'd be happy to help in that regard. Have faith. Most people do well. Most people aren't that close to intubation and aren't that close to death. But if you are, um, it, it's a frightening experience and don't try to do it alone. Um, Steve, if I can, you mentioned Jerry Eisenberg and shout out to him. He emails or texts me every day and has been a huge friend in this process as has been Jen Beatty and many others, program directors and colleagues. And so, I am very grateful for their love and support. Well, thanks again, uh, Bob, very much. I, I look forward to seeing you in, in complete health at, at some point somewhere in, in the future. And best to all of your family. Thanks, thanks. for taking the time, especially under the circumstances, to speak with us today. Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to tell my story.